So let me welcome you here at the Wiener Konzerthaus. Let me welcome you most cordially here. And for me, indeed, together with the president of the Austrian Federal Council, Mr. Ingo P., it's a great pleasure and honor for me to be able to welcome you here officially and to officially open the conference of uh, speakers of parliaments um, of EU member states and the European Parliament 2019. Now, because the historical building of the parliament along the Ringstraße is being refurbished where we otherwise would have met, we have chosen Wiener Konzerthaus as our venue for the annual conference. And we did so, and today, in the evening, when we have our dinner at the Leopold Museum, and where we will give you a short tour of the current exhibition, Vienna at the, the year 1920 and 1900, and also a solo exhibition of Oskar Kokoschka. And this is to show you that it was around 1900 that Vienna had a very special um, radiance here in Austria. It was built in the Jugendstil, this building here. And you find this kind of a fantasiacal style in Brussels, in Barcelona, and in Prague. It's a style which covered all of Europe. And these two places, these two venues, will also show you what is the spirit. It always concerned European issues. And this is what we want to emphasize. And I hope that this setting will also be an inspiration for our discussion. But before I deal with the subject matters of our agenda, I would like to give the floor to the President of the Federal Council, our second chamber, Mr. Ingo Ape. Mr. President, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, also, on my behalf, I would like to welcome you to the conference of uh, speakers of uh, EU Parliament here in Vienna. Ever since the uh, founding uh, of this conference, this format has developed to be a very important forum for parliamentary exchanges, and I'm convinced that today cooperation among parliamentarians is more important than ever before. It is only if this dialogue among parliamentarians of the different legislative chambers of all member states and also beyond that is maintained very intensively, will we be in a position in the future as well to meet our responsibility and to take uh, the right and correct decisions in European matters for our citizens. The European Union is going through turbulent times and is uh, facing uh, very demanding challenges within the European Union, but also globally, especially Brexit, but also other challenges such as the uh, change of climate, the migration, technological innovations, or conflicts in our neighborhood. The confidence of citizens in the uh, European Union project has suffered increasingly in recent years, and therefore EU critical voices have become more audible increasingly. I think we can agree that uh, this uh, confidence has to be regained. The European Union has to be resilient and has to prove that it can withstand crisis without uh, forgetting the welfare of its citizens. The Austrian presidency therefore made it its task to bring the EU closer to people once again through more transparency. And one means to reach this goal is, among other things, uh, the demand that and the means to reach this goal is primarily forcing and stepping up uh, the uh, principle of subsidiary, which is of central importance for the European Union. There are many challenges that can be decided in a much better way in the member states or in the regions because this will be closer to citizens. 
subsidiarity and thus co-determination in European legislative and decision-making processes constitute uh, a s important principle for local and regional territorial cooperation when it comes to shaping Europe in the future. Regional parliaments must therefore be integrated ever more so into European legislative acts. And for a more efficient and active uh, subsidiarity, we also need a permanent uh, formal and informal dialogue between the regions on the one hand and the European Union on the other hand. And we will continue to need a very strong union with institutions that are capable of acting in order to be able to cope with the major challenges on a European level and to do so effectively. The Austrian Federal Ch Council is the interface between the EU and the citizens in this country. And as the speaker of that chamber, I'm very happy and proud that the EU uh, committee of the Federal Council is very committed to EU matters and acts here with much commitment. And it also handles subsidiarity controls, and it is one of the most active chambers of all national parliaments in this connection. And the guarantee for this citizen uh, proximity to citizen the Federal Council is not only a chamber for Europe, but also a chamber for the future. I'm convinced that uh, the cap capability to act and the resilience to crisis on the other hand, and proximity to, and to citizens and transparency on the other hand, the confidence that has been lost will be regained confidence into the European Union. And it's also with a view to the European elections that will come this May, the countries and the regions play a very important role because it is the countries, the states and the regions that are the closest to the citizens and therefore they can contribute essentially uh, to informing citizens and making sure that uh, plenty of people go and vote. And uh, a special significance attaches here to the cooperation between national parliaments and the EU institutions. I'm very pleased, therefore, that uh, we will be dedicating a session to this topic, which will help us to promote cooperation on the very different levels in the European Union. Ladies and gentlemen, let me close by reconfirming once again that I'm convinced that the uh, solution of complex European issues can only be found if we have an interparliamentary dialogue. E making Europe stronger and more efficient is something that we can learn. And it is in this spirit that I invite you to participating in the parliamentary exchanges and to come up with constructive uh, solutions for our problems here in uh, Europe. And as the uh, president of the uh, Federal Council, I'd like to welcome you once again to Vienna, and I wish you a successful conference here in Vienna, and have also a pleasant stay here in Vienna. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, at the beginning, I'd like to inform you briefly about some organizational aspects. If you want to take the floor, can you please use the request for the floor cards that you will find in your conference kits? Hand in those cards at the table close to the entrance of the room. And requests for the floor will be accepted until the end of the presentation of the last speaker. As soon as the debate has been opened, the list of speakers will be closed and delegates will be given the floor basically in the order in which they submitted their requests for the floor. All relevant documents have been distributed before the conference. If there is need to print uh, any documents, then this can be done outside of the room. Please turn to the information desk uh, in the lobby. The conference will be transmitted via the website of the European of the Austrian Parliament in German and in English via live stream. And we will also use Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. And in addition, the conference will be available as video on demand on the YouTube channel of the Austrian Parliament. It will be available there in English. Finally, I'd like to point out 
that pictures will be taken throughout the conference by our photographer. And we will make these pictures available to you as quickly as possible on our website. And after the conference, we will send you the link to these pictures. And therefore, I would like to ask you uh, not to make too many pictures in addition to the photos that will be taken by our photographer. Now, before we adopt the agenda, I'd like uh, to make an announcement concerning the conclusions. Today, at the meeting of the Troika, we agreed on a compromise text, and this will be made available to you briefly. And here we have tried to take account of the uh, amendment wishes of delegations in the best possible manner. The deadline for applications to modify this compromise text of the Troika is tonight at 8 p.m. May we ask you to send your requests for modification to the following email address, amendments-eu-speakers at parliament.gv.at. If we do not receive any applications for modifications from you, then we take it that you are in agreement with the compromise text. And now I would like to give back the floor to the uh, President of the National Council. Thank you very much. Before I give the floor to the Vice President of the European Parliament, I would like to address briefly the issue of European neighborhood, which is very important, uh, which is uh, it ranges from Morocco to Egypt, from the Middle East uh, to Turkey, and uh, to the Eastern partners in the European Union. It also includes the Russian Federation, without which uh, there can be no lasting peace in Europe. And it also covers, in particular, the countries of the Western Balkan. And since uh, the year 2003, they have had a European perspective the migration crisis of 2015 showed once again that it is necessary to find new ways of cooperation with the countries of the Mediterranean. The EU Africa Forum of December 2018 here in Vienna gave a very important impulse in this connection. Basically, it is an issue of this partnership with Africa and uh, this puts uh, economic development, education, innovation into the center. Only if we succeed in giving the people in Africa perspectives on an equal footing, will it be possible to dampen in the long term to uh, put the migration pressure. Turkey today is a very important strategic partner of the European Union. This applies also for the economic cooperation, the security and energy matters, and for security policy, but also in particular for fighting terrorism. However, there are developments in Turkey that affect and compromise the fundamental rights and the freedom of the media. This is reflected to some extent in the Turkish-speaking population in our countries, and therefore we are following this very closely. In Ukraine, the EU has a very important role to play as a mediator for the conflict in Donbas. There are no alternatives to the trans uh, implementation of the Minsk agreements and the talks in the Normandy format, uh, which uh, France and uh, Germany have been conducting with lots of perseverance. The relations uh, of the European Union to Russia are affected by the uh, Conflict, conflict in the Donbass and the various espionage and cyber incidents. Without uh, visible progress in the Minsk process, there can be no uh, easing of the EU sanction against Russia. Russia, however, is a very important neighbor, and um, both on an official but also on the level of the civil society, we have to remain in an open dialogue. And it is of central importance for Austria's foreign policy and our parliament to have relations uh, with the uh, states of the Western Balkan. The Western Balkan has priority for us because, first of all, the uh, peace uh, process of the European Union will be completed only if the countries of the Western Balkan also belong to the European Union. Secondly, the stability of Southeast Europe is in the interest of Europe and uh, all of Europe, and bringing um, these countries closer 
to us and uh, integrating them into the European Union is, uh, uh, has a lasting stability effect. The European Union and European companies are the biggest investors on the Western Balkan. So for reasons of economic policy, it's of great interest for the European Union to further develop the rule of law and democracy in these countries. And for the necessary reforms, there is no stronger incentive than this uh, perspective of accession. And fourth, it cannot be in the interest of the European Union to leave the immediate neighborhood to the influence of global competitors. It is only through a strong commitment of the European Union on the Western Balkan, which will prevent that there will be a vacuum that will be used by other actors. One thing is also very clear. Europe is not only a promise, but Europe is also a mutual obligation. And for the uh, candidate countries, this means that through their reforms, they must become mature for accession. By trade light, uh, accession light certainly is not an option. And for the European Union, this means, on the other hand, that it must be credible and uh, honor all the progress that is being made and must act credibly in connection with the accession perspective. Uh, because it has just been shown in Macedonia and Greece that uh, there can be compromise and this needs to be respected. And I would like to commend both countries for having achieved this progress. In the dialogue between Belgrade and Pristina, we need some new impetus in order to reach uh, some normalization of the relationships. The Council of the European Union will talk about the accession or taking up uh, accession negotiations with the further candidate countries, and Austria hopes that this step will be possible. I can see that that this pre-accession process of the European Union to the Western Balkan uh, is also a very important role for the European Parliament because questions of the rule of law, fundamental rights, and good governance are among the essential uh, values of Euro EU integration, and therefore the parliaments of EU member states and the European Parliament can play here a very important supporting role. The Austrian Parliament offers a program of scholarships for the staff members of uh, parliamentary administrations in the West Balkan states and supports initiatives uh, to mediate and to support democracy. And the European Parliament and other national parliaments are also active in this direction. It is in this uh, spirit that I look forward to our discussions. And now I would like to give the floor to the first Vice President of the European Parliament, Merit McGuinness. But before I give the floor to Merit McGuinness, I would like to ask you, do you agree to the agenda as it has been uh, submitted to you and as it is before you? If this is, uh, if I don't see any sign to the contrary, then I would like to ask uh, the uh, Vice President to take the floor. Thank you, Shun. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Um, my thanks uh, to our hosts here in Vienna, and thank you for the beautiful weather, which also makes it nice to be here. Um, Mr. Schwabta and Mr. Appe, you've prepared well. I am going to start with, I suppose, a counterpoint in relation to your comments on accession. I am strategically located beside Dame Winterton from the United Kingdom, so I will make a few remarks about Brexit because that is, of course, one of the challenges that the European Union faces um, because it is the first time a major member state has voted to leave the European Union. As you know, colleagues, this Wednesday the leaders of Europe will meet again to look at a proposal from the British Prime Minister, Theresa May, uh, to extend the Article 50 deadline. And while there's a lot of debate and conversation around this point, I think our focus must be on what Europe and the United Kingdom wishes to see, which is an orderly Brexit. And if that requires time, I think that we will be open to that. But as others have said earlier, we do need a plan to see how this um, evolving uh, Brexit will finalise. I think it is in the interest of all European citizens that we have patience, as President Tusk has said, but also that we learn lessons, that Brexit has happened and perhaps um, there are things we could learn in order to avoid something similar happening in the future. Maybe it is how we communicate or how we were not listening, uh, but there are reasons why UK citizens rejected Europe. And perhaps it speaks to a politics where you are either for something 
or desperately against. And I think it is that polarization of politics that we all face in our own member states and that we need to try and work towards a, a politics of compromise rather than of conflict. So let us all hope that this week the leaders of Europe will come to a good decision about uh, the extending the deadline for the Bre Brexit uh, scenario. Let me move to other challenges as I set the scene here this afternoon. I think we all know that climate change is a big challenge and that young people are particularly motivated. Very young people are leaving their classrooms and are energised and concerned about their future. We in the Parliament support decarbonisation. We want to bring zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 and we want Member States to commit to achieving that goal. Uh, the Parliament believes that we can have economic prosperity, we can have global industrial competitiveness and a strong climate policy and that these are not incompatible. I'm not sure we've convinced all our citizens that these are not incompatible and we need to work harder on that. We need to invest in industrial innovation, digital technologies, clean technologies and energy efficiency so we stimulate growth, enhance competitiveness and promote future skills and new job creation. Digitalization and artificial intelligence will change the future of work, the future of our societies and how our citizens live. And I think these changes are bringing about fears in some um, parts of our society and we need to acknowledge and deal with those concerns and those fears. And I do believe that if we don't create a socially sustainable single market for this new economy which is emerging, we could lose out to other global players and lose uh, in terms of competition, but also our confidence and the confidence of our citizens. I do believe we can face these challenges together better as a union with common institutions, rules and principles of solidarity amongst member states. But there are other challenges. I spoke at a conference in Ireland at the weekend about literacy. And it was disturbing to learn that in our member states across Europe, there are 55 million adults who have difficulties with literacy and numeracy. And that feeds into difficulties with political literacy. So I think there are big challenges for us, but we must also look at those social challenges where people feel excluded from the process. And certainly literacy is one of those. Let me move to our European elections, which take place in all our member states on the 23rd to the 26th of May. I didn't mention the number of member states because while there are 28 full members at the moment, um, we are not entirely clear about what the United Kingdom will do, although one expects that the United Kingdom will hold elections. So we have six weeks to go. And we know from our Eurobarometer poll that the trust of citizens in the European Union is at its highest in 35 years. So is support um, for EU membership, with Europe being viewed as a good thing for more than 60% of our citizens. I would rather we had a better word than a good thing, because I think Europe has to be not just about a thing, it has to be about a feeling and a sense of involvement and inclusion and belonging. All elections are important, but I think these are particularly important given some of the observations I've just brought to your attention. And there are developments in politics in member states which give us an indication as to the outcome of our European Parliament elections. And I think that what I would say to you as members of national parliaments, as speakers and deputy speakers, you are part of this process. I hope that you don't see yourselves and your parliaments as just bystanders in this process. It is so important that national parliaments are working with and engaged in European Parliament elections. We should not be doing this on our own. We are colleagues in democracy and therefore your engagement in the European Parliament elections is absolutely pivotal. I think we should stop saying that European Parliament elections are secondary elections. They should not be. They are elections and they are just as important as national elections and we should make sure that that message takes hold. We cannot take these elections lightly. We want to increase the number who participate in those elections. So I was happy this afternoon to engage in the promotion of our parliamentary elections at EU level. And I urge you to do the same and work with us to make sure that there is a very strong turnout at these elections. 
I think you also will agree with me that we need to sh make sure that there are measures in place to safeguard the integrity of the electoral process, not just these upcoming European elections, but all elections across our member states. We need rules which force social networks to remove content that is designed to manipulate public opinion. We also need to ensure that online platforms work with law enforcement authorities to pinpoint the sources of foreign disinformation. And lastly, we need to be able to impose penalties on all organisations which make illegal use of citizens' personal data to influence their voting intentions. These aims, colleagues, are easier said than done, done rather, but I do think we are better aware of the challenges that we face. One of my responsibilities as Vice President of the Parliament is religious dialogue provided for in Article 17 of the Treaty. And I'm really happy that the Austrian Presidency took it as one of the points in the Presidency conclusions of this EU Speakers Conference. I think we should never underestimate the role of religion and politics and the influence at parish and ground level of different uh, religious uh, communities and indeed non-confessional organisations. In July, which seems very far away, but it's not, but in July of this year, after the elections, a new parliament will start work on the new legislative term. The election of the new commission president and agreement on the political program of the new commission will mark the political priorities after the elections. Member states will meet in the European Council, firstly in Romania, on Schumann Day, and then formally in June to decide on the strategic agenda and on high-level appointments. Many discussions between the newly elected Parliament's political groups and the Member States need to take place to guarantee a smooth transition and election of the new Commission. With cooperation, which we need, both cross-party and between Member States, and this cooperation must be built on the basis of European values, which are enshrined in our treaties that we've all signed up to, and on the basis of the need to tackle these future challenges. Above all, and I will repeat it, we need the ability to compromise to find solutions. I hope the debates before the elections will allow that to happen. Institutional or political deadlock is not in anyone's interest, and indeed it is very sapping of our political capital and morale in some member states. I have to mention the issue of gender balance. I think this is particularly important that we need to look at gender balance of high-level appointments in the composition of the future commission of high offices to the parliament. And to put it very simply, there must be more women in leadership positions in the European Union. I think our citizens are demanding that, that they need to be represented equally in all of our institutions. This year marks the 10th anniversary of the entry into force of the Treaty of Lisbon, the so-called Treaty of Parliaments. And indeed, the Lisbon Treaty has fundamentally changed inter-parliamentary cooperation in Europe and has made national parliaments actors on the European level. Cooperation between national parliaments and the European Parliament is vital, not just now, but into the future. This cooperation has intensified and broadened continuously. We don't always share the same views, but all our debates reflect mutual respect and a strong political will for constructive dialogue. These debates are an illustration of a lively European parliamentary democracy. We will continue to develop this dialogue and our working methods further in the future. And I hope you will recall that at one of my very first meetings, I mentioned, and I believe it passionately, that there can only be a strong European Union with stronger engagement between national parliaments and the European Parliament, and I still hold to that view. The next five years will be crucial for the European Union, and we know that time marches on. Interparliamentary debate and cooperation will become even more important to tackle the challenges that lie ahead. The need for wide cooperation, both across party lines and among the member states, can be reinforced by interparliamentary cooperation and dialogue. At the end of this term, I would like to encourage all parties and all parliaments involved to stay committed to this cooperation, even if it is difficult and demanding of your time, and to continue our successful story of interparliamentary cooperation in the next five years. 
And just finally, to repeat my call for your support to encourage your citizens to engage in elections to the European Parliament, to encourage them not to see Europe as a choice to be for or against the European Union, but rather to see us as being capable as countries and citizens of fixing the things where Europe is weak. And that will be a constant battle because Europe is a creation of mankind and therefore will continue to hold imperfections. But also to stress the many positive things that being part of Europe has given us. In particular, to have the capacity to sit at a table as we are today with so many colleagues representing our citizens and looking to deal with the challenges of the future, not bowed down by them, but rather encourage that together we can actually make a success. Thank you.